Good day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Today we're going to talk about polyurea thickeners. Now this is one that's been requested a few times, so hopefully I do this justice. We're going to talk a little bit about how polyurea greases are made in the chemical sense, so where a polyurea comes from, a little bit about the manufacturing process, and how they're different from the standard metal soap greases. So let's get into it. All right, let's talk about polyurea thickeners. So in our standard representation of all the different thickeners, you'll remember that we split into soap and non-soap thickeners. And among the soaps, there are simple and complex. Of course, you can vary the metal that's in them, but they're all based on the same technology. Then when you have non-soap greases, we basically split it into the calcium sulfonates, clays, and the polyureas. Now, I'm sure there are other non-soap based thickeners, but these are sort of the, the main ones that are available on the market. It's often helpful because people are so familiar with the soap based ones to contrast polyurea greases with the standard soap ones. So soaps are the salt of a fatty acid, if you'll remember, where we react an acid and a base and we get salt plus water. So the metal salt is the thickener. And one thing that you'll notice there is that water is a byproduct of the process. So during manufacturing, we have to uh, you know, pull that water out of the final product because obviously we don't want water in our grease. Now there is another version of this where we, where we react an ester instead of an acid. And in that case, the byproduct will be methanol. Again, you have to remove the methanol before you can sell the product. Polyureas are quite different. So polyureas are an isocyanate plus an amine gives you a polyurea. A couple of things to note there. First of all, isocyanates and amines are highly reactive and they're quite toxic. So a lot of places I know that make polyurea greases will actually have completely dedicated facilities to those and there'll be all kinds of controls around the raw materials. The other thing that you'll notice is that polyurea is the only product of this reaction. There is no byproduct like water or methanol that you have to remove. Now that's not to say that the manufacturing process is simpler. There is just a step that's present with uh, the regular metal soaps that you don't have in polyurea. So first of all, we want to probably talk about what an amine is. It's part of the reaction, very, very common in nature, but let's just maybe give an analog of water and then we'll talk about amines. So let's start with water. If I swap out one of those hydrogens for an ox, uh, sorry, for a, an R, you know, alkyl group, this is of course an alcohol. And if I swap out the other R, then I get an ether. Now, the analog with ammonia, right, NH3 instead of H2O, is that if I swap out one of those hydrogens for an alkyl group, then I have an amine, and we would usually refer to this as a 1-amine. And if I swap out another one for an alkyl group, I get a 2-amine, and then of course a 3-amine. Now, the thing to note there, and the reason why amines tend to be toxic, is because frequently that R functional group that sits off to the side of the amine is uh, a multi-ring aromatic. So we talked a little bit in the last video about uh, aromatics and how they look like a lot of DNA molecules, which means that when you get exposed to these, they can often slip into uh, the DNA replication process and disrupt it. And that's why a lot of those uh, multi-ring aromatics are considered carcinogens, kind of like benzene is. Now we can also create polyamines. So if we have, we can treat this NH2 as kind of like a functional group. And so if we have multiple ones of them, then we have a polyamine. Now the isocyanate molecule is quite different. This is how it looks and it's highly reactive. One of the reasons it's so toxic is because, uh, because it is so highly reactive. So if you breathe it in, for example, it is a huge lung irritant and it's been known to cause asthma. So again, you have to be very careful when you handle it. Again, if we have two of these, for want of a better word, functional groups, we can create uh, effectively polyisocyanates. What I'm showing here is one with two functional groups, therefore it is a diisocyanate. Finally, the other important functional group to know is ureas. So this is what it looks like, right? It's a bit of a combination of an isocyanate and an amine, that makes sense. Um, and this bit in the middle is the urea group. So now we come to reacting an isocyanate with an amine to get a polyurea. Now it should be noticed that 
This particular reaction is not unique to the grease world. We make polyureas for a range of other things. Um, most notably, I've seen it used uh, for the creation of things like bulletproof vests. So it can form extremely strong barrier films. Now we're going to start, rather than showing you how to make a polyurea, let's, let's just look at a, a standard monourea. And the way that we do that is to react an isocyanate with an amine. And if I rearrange all the reactants, I can get the product urea, right? So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Now, if I want to create uh, a more complex molecule, I can react a diisocyanate with two 1-amines, and that will give us a urea that has two separate urea functional groups. And that creates my favorite molecule in the whole of the lubrication world, which is, of course, diurea. Now, the one thing about the diarrhea mo molecule uh, that it is uh, worth noting straight off the bat is that it has polarity built in. So the difference in electronegativity values between oxygen and carbon is high enough, and the difference between the hydrogen and nitrogen is large enough that the oxygens are effectively negatively charged and the hydrogens are positively charged. And that's really important for how the thickener comes together because they naturally want to bond with each other. These diurea molecules generally form hydrogen bonds, right? So the oxygens and the hydrogens on either side want to bond with each other because they are charged. Now, we can compare this with metal soaps. So I'm showing here a, a simple lithium grease, right? And what you can see here is that there is no hydrogen bonding that occurs between the, the lithium molecules. In some sort of circumstances, yes, the hydrogen on the OH functional group can try to bond uh, with the oxygen that's that's close to the, the metal head, um, but it's much less frequent, right? So that gives you an indication of like the shear stability properties. One thing that we do to create more strength or more shear strength between the uh, fibers of a uh, metal soap is of course to include a complexing agent and often that complexing agent will be something like a diacid or a diester and that will help uh, cross-link the two of them together but again we have to rely on an extra process rather than uh, something which is inbuilt into the molecule itself now as we can start to see some more differences too so the metal head is usually uh, charged on a on a metal soap and that's what it attracts it to the water, right, if it were a detergent. Now, metals are known oxidation catalysts. And that's one of the great properties of a polyurea is because it contains no metal, it is highly oxidatively stable. And therefore, you get very long lifetimes out of these greases. The other thing to note is that the manufacturing process is extremely uh, important in determining the final uh, kind of mechanical stability of a polyurea product. So the way that they're manufactured is that you put the isocyanate and the amine together in the presence of a base oil. And although they will react readily, the let's say the, the gel structure that they form or the crystal structure that they form is highly dependent on the heating profile. So it's a little bit like when you form steel, right? Steel fundamentally has the same components to it, although, okay, there are alloying agents and things like that. But fundamentally, you can make many different kinds of steel with the same products, sorry, with, with the same, yeah, uh, ingredients by heating it and cooling it in very specific ways. And you can do the same thing with a polyurea grease. So at the very top of the, uh, of the reactant, you, you hold that temperature for a little while and then you cool it again with a very specific profile and that and then at the end you homogenize the, the grease. So that again, that heating and cooling profile is hugely uh, determinant in how the, the, the mechanical properties will look. The other thing that's unique about polyurea greases is the way that they interact with the additives. So again, most additives, not all additives, because you have things like, uh, you know, polymers and that, but a lot of ad additives are surface active. 
And that's a very fancy way of saying that they are charged, right? Because metal surfaces are charged. And if therefore our EP anti-wear, you know, rust inhibitors or corrosion inhibitors are also charged, then they'll want to attract themselves to metal surfaces. And that makes sense. We're trying to protect metal surfaces most of the time. The problem is that because the polyurea molecules are themselves highly charged, they often outcompete the metal surfaces and they won't release additives uh, to work on metal surfaces. So the additive chemistry that you use in polyurea grease formulations is very different. And that's uh, one of the reasons why polyurea greases tend to be incompatible with others. It's actually because the, the ad packs are completely different families. Going even further, the way that they interact with base oils is very different as well. So with the lithium or other metal soaps, you'll remember that that long hydrocarbon tail is what binds itself to the base oil, right? And of course, when we put it under stress, that bond is weak enough that it can then release the base oil to do its work. The problem that we have with polyurea greases is that we don't really have that. Um, we have something that is highly charged and therefore there's no way for the base oil to really connect to a, a polyurea molecule. That's particularly a problem when we start to formulate with let's say group three or PAO base oils, right? Because they're highly nonpolar, they just don't want to connect with a, a polyurea molecule. So often we'll have to introduce some kind of co-base like, uh, like an alkylated naphthalene, for example, or an ester, or even a, a, a naphthenic uh, crude or a naphthenic base oil uh, to help really bind the base oil with the polyurea grease. So where would we use uh, polyurea? Well, as I mentioned before, the oxidative stability is just off the charts, right? Because it contains no metal in it, which would act as a, uh, an oxidation catalyst. It means that they last a really long time. Typically where we see it is in fill for, fill for life bearings. So there's a lot of applications, you know, for example, you know, your, uh, if you think about the fan that you have in your house, you don't replace the grease on that fan, right? Uh, it's not like you do an oil change or, or a grease change on that. Um, it's expected to last the entire life of that fan bearing. So in fill for life applications, you know, the polyurea greases work out really well because often the thickener will outlast the, the bearing life. Another place where we use it is uh, constant velocity joints. So you'll see these a lot and, and the balls themselves get very hot. They can get to like 150, 170 degrees Celsius. And so the thermo, thermo oxidative stability of a polyurea grease really helps us in these kinds of applications. And finally, we sometimes see it in agricultural equipment as well. So one thing I didn't really talk about is the thixotropic behavior of polyurea greases, where they are probably less shear stable than let's say a lithium complex for example and what that means is that when they when they're acting they kind of tend to uh, especially when they're being stressed a lot they sort of turn into a liquid but the advantage of the polyurea grease is because it forms hydrogen bonds when you release the stress on it and you let it cool down it actually reforms the crystalline structure so that's really good for things like farm machinery because you know you're relying on, on, on farmers who are not necessarily you know, professional mechanics who are maintaining their own equipment. You, you want a scenario in which if there is, for example, a, a leaking seal, that rather than leaking out of the application as an oil would, the grease is able to do its work. And then when we stop running the, you know, the, the, the tractor or the harvester or anything like that, it then thickens up and stays in the application. So that's that's another example where we would use a polyurea grease. Anyway, I know this has been a little bit longer, but polyurea greases are really interesting, uh, a very different chemistry to the rest of the uh, uh, soap-based uh, thickeners at least. And uh, I think they've, they've got you know great applicability in the industry. So as usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.